And we are live. G'day, folks. Thanks a lot for tuning in to this week's Facebook Live. We'll just wait a couple of moments until people hop online, Steve, before we do a big intro to everyone. We've got a false start. Everyone probably logged into the last video before <laughs> we had IT technical difficulties here. So. If you can see us and hear us and, and watch us, um, yeah, flick us a text, send us a message. Hey, Sam, how you doing? Um, here we go. It's, uh, welcome aboard, everyone. Sam here. Um, thanks for being there straight away with your comment on the yield curve and what's happening out in the economy. Uh, the yield curve in the US was inverted a few days ago after being inverted for over... Uh, it's uninverted, sorry, after being inverted for over two years since the start of the fireworks. It's all transitory, safe and resilient, of course, nothing to see here. Um, I stopped going on the clown show of media when um, when I could see that everything that, in, that I knew about, that I was talking about in the media was a clown show out there. And, um, you know, they said safe and effective two weeks to flatten the curve, lots of different things we've heard the news say, Steve. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just transitory, right? So I've got some cool things to talk about today, but before we get into uh, the news articles, I want to introduce you. Vince here said, hi, Steve, a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a while since we've had Steve online. Steve and Sidorowski from Zenith Legal, thank you for joining me tonight. Thanks for having me, Dave. It's always fun and Great to catch up, and uh, yeah, so uh, we go, we go back. It's, it's like how long do you reckon we've known each other for? Like fifteen years or something? Yeah, it's been a while, eh? Long time. Yeah, like, yeah fifteen years, yeah, longer. Um, maybe. Yeah, it's probably about fifteen years. Yeah, maybe a bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've known Steve for the fifteen years. We came across each other um, by someone else that I used to do some work with, mm. and then you were working for a law firm, and you were sort of a uni, like you just finished mm. your uni, your law degree, and yeah. uh, we clicked, and I've seen like really dodgy lawyers out there, when I say dodgy lawyers, like just shit ones, right, they're just mm. clumsy, they lose deals, they drop deals, they put you at risk, uh, conveyances, right, oh, <laughs> um, we had a conveyance once for a client, um, before we met you, it was like way back in the really early days, and uh we just sent a deal, it was a bulk deal, and the conveyancer tried buying one of the units from underneath us. It was oh, just wow. like wild, wild west sort of shit. It's yeah. like crazy. So um, I've, I've caused lots of uh, pain for you over the years, Steve, like good times and bad times. I've, I've, I've <laughs> caused you a lot of grief from buying stuff that I can't afford at the time. And It's been a, it's been a wild ride. <laughs> we've massaged these deals yeah. for safety. We've never, we've got all our fingers and toes. And yeah, we're good. We're good. We came through. It's only because of you, Steve. Like, there's so many times I could have died financially um, or, you know, just painfully, like, deals blowing up. Like, I was, I was doing a podcast earlier today and stupid, fucking stupid of me pushing myself. I bought 30 motels, right, mm. in two years and like... Yep. Steve's like, I don't know, tell these people, yeah. you don't have the money, mate. <laughs> um, yeah. And we pulled through and they're all settled to, to safety and, uh, you know, we've got some fun stories. To yeah, that's right, 100%. So, but um, we're going to talk to Steve and so get your questions ready for Steve. And if you do have some, um, you'd normally be paying lots of money for a lawyer. And, uh, you know, we've got Stephen here. He doesn't have the taxi meter charging. So ask him as many <laughs> questions as you've got whilst he's here. And um, we've got lots of cool things to talk about as well when it comes to um, yeah, legal matters. So, as usual, I'm going to hop into some cool articles. And uh, there's only a few here today. Uh, so I'll hop into these. I've got three articles. Nothing. It's a quiet news week this week. Um, just three fun things to share. And then we'll hop into Steve. Steve's got one. I, I gave him my fourth one. But um, here's one here. Other world technology. Hmm. Presidential aides, CIA claim. Right? And if you look back before they changed, like uh, conspiracy theories, let's go to conspiracy theories out there. A lot of conspiracy theories have said, next thing they're going to do is a fake alien invasion to get everyone distracted and then you see that. 
And you look back into the 1960s, I think it was like 1968, 1970, they had the moon landing, right? Mm. Some people think it's fake, some people think it's not. I'm not even getting into a discussion of that, right? Mm. The discussion that I find most ironic is the timing that it occurred, right? It was smoke screen, right? People were like, oh, the moon landing, right? Thunderbirds were on TV, right? You've got bloody puppets floating through the sky. Yeah. Where... Um, we go for a drive. I drive home about a half an hour away from my office, right? I drive a half an hour from my fucking office and my phone drops out sometimes, right? We can't get a mobile phone in 2024 to work from your house to my house, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever, right? But somehow, 50 years ago, they got a guy, the, the president had a landline to the moon, right? <laughs> it's funny, right? But a lot of people have been saying that when the next... The timing that occurred, right? They did the moon landing, and no one questioned that the US dollar was deleveraged from gold, right? Mm. It was a time of, you know, coming together. There's always been an issue in the world, but they they have these events that occur sometimes. I just found it interesting that people have been joking, oh, there'll be an alien invasion and all that mm. sort of stuff, and now they're coming out in the news with CIA potential articles here, um, you know, saying that there could be other world technologies, there could be, this is on mainstream media, this is on like Bloomberg or News.com or something like that, and it's 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 articles about potential, you know, alien hmm. life forms from other planets, and people will start getting talking, oh yeah, there was a Tupac risen from the heavens, right, who knows, <laughs> right, <laughs> something will happen, and it's just very interesting. Besides Tupac coming down from the heavens, this is probably the most craziest thing that I think we should look at, right? This here is Citibank is now banking in and saying there'll be a 50 basis rate cut in September. Mm-hmm. We're in September now. Uh, this is from investing.com um, and Reuters. Uh, it goes in to say, City analysts have noticed dated Wednesday maintain that a 50 basis point rate cut at the upcoming September Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC meeting, remains their base, best base case scenario. The July FOMC minutes provided the clearest indication yet the Federal Reserve has leaned towards policy easing with the vast majority of officials viewing such a move as appropriate. The minutes confirmed that many officials were inclined to cut rates even before recent uh, economic, uh, softer economic data. The vast majority of Fed officials indicated that should there be a date, data continue to meet expectations, it would likely be appropriate to ease policy at the September meeting. So. Yeah, with um, with that, the news is now coming out to say rate cuts are on the way. Um, here's a video from our friend there, Fed Chair Powell. Um, Jerome Powell indicates interest rate cuts ahead. The time has come for policy to adjust. Uh, we've now started seeing the big banks starting to drop their rates. The fixed rates are dropping. CBA have dropped rates. Um, so yeah, we're now at a point where we're at rate cuts, right? And they're not talking 25 basis points, and I never said that they'd come down by 25 basis points. Mm. They fall much faster than what they've gone up, and who knows what's going to happen, right? Uh, it's just, ironically, just as much as the other world, right? Um, <laughs> I can't read <laughs> I'm going to read that last one, right? Um, <laughs> Zach says here, my missus is uh, getting very excited. I can't say the word over the upcoming rate cuts. They're doing a better job than I can. <laughs> <laughs> Fun when it comes to economic conversations. You don't see that often out there in the world of finance. But, um, you know, this stuff just fallen from the sky, right? Just like these rate cuts are falling through. And, um, you know, Australia. We're here, right? Like a 50%, 50 basis point rate card, 50 basis point rate card. But we could see 1%, 2% over a period of three to six months come down from the, the cash rate. And what would that look like? We've always got to think like everyone's thinking today, right? People are scared of the interest rates. Like, yeah, it shit happens, right? Deal with the interest rates. Mm. But what happens in six months' time? What happens in 12 months' time? What happens in five years' time? What's it going to look like? If they cut rates, Steve. You do like dozens of deals a week for us, right? Like hmm. uh, property transactions. When you do those transactions, you see the patterns that we work with, right? You know my data probably better than I do, right? Because mm-hmm. you're seeing how many deals come through, where they're at, where they're based, all that. Our property's been crashing as the interest rates have gone up. 
Yeah, no, definitely not. <laughs> um, you know, there's just uh, they, they just keep uh, different areas. You know, little pockets, and um, yeah, they're still still pushing on. I'll be sending you like a hundred contracts this month or next month in one suburb or one region, like one city could be any study, could be anywhere. Steve does deals all around Australia. And then the next minute, like, you're probably sitting there going, fuck, there's no deals coming through from there. And it's like, the deals don't stack up anymore. The numbers mm. don't work. Like, everything's gone up crazy. Like, yeah. we're yeah. buying in Townsville. How much were we paying for? What was a cheap property in Townsville 18 months ago? 100? 120? Yeah. yeah, probably around that. Yeah. What is it? What's a cheap one now that you can see? Yeah, like two, around the 200. 220, something yeah. like that, on a yeah. cheap day. And I can't even get them. Mm. Like, they're all 300. Yeah. Um, so here we are. Is um, is is you know what? If we're seeing properties double, would you would have you seen have you seen any properties double in the last year, Steve? Um, a year ago, or two years, eighteen months, two years ago. Yeah, probably in the last. Like we still get the odd ones, um, sort of around the Gold Coast area. So we had that yeah. that big boom. So when you're talking about properties doubling, yeah, um, that's a good example that I've seen. Yeah, um, you probably there's probably other ones as well, but that one I can see because I remember the deals that used to come through. Well, you actually seen because we've started. We've seen the. Um... <laughs> 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 I don't know the comments in here. Come on, guys. Let's keep it PG and like respectful. Come on. Um, I like having a laugh. That's what I like having. So, um, <laughs> that's, that's a good one. That's pretty. <laughs> um, you've seen, Steve, that we've bought all these properties five years ago in the Gold Coast, 10 years ago. And we've now started, like, we do sales right like i've employed sales teams throughout my businesses yeah. and we have real estate sales in different markets and those markets are ones that have gone up and doubled and tripled so now you're seeing the same clients that bought the property for 200 selling them for five or six hundred thousand yep. that's a full life cycle 100 yeah, yeah. percent. That, that's what i've been seeing i've yeah. been seeing those deals come through yeah. and um and yeah i just I, I just remember the when we were buying and there was because yeah. we concentrate on an area and then we move with the market. So, yeah, um, yeah 100%. Like that. Some people are still sitting there going, I want to buy a Mount Druitt for 200000 Man, that went like 10 yeah. years ago. Like the Gold so. When When you're <clears throat> buying the Gold Coast, because you even like, bought it yourself in there. Like, you were yeah. an investor yourself. And yeah. It's rare to find a lawyer that's an investor themselves, right? I remember having to check. Yeah, like, that's right. Fuck all my clients are buying and making money. I need to get like some of these other things <laughs> happening. Yeah. But buying in the. In the in the in the Gold Coast back in the day, that was stupid, wasn't it? Like mm. People were like, "Why would you buy there? The market's crashing, whatever." Yeah. But that was the, the opportunity. There's still markets around um, that are still lower than what they were ten years ago. Uh, I bought one in Sydney yesterday, or today. Well, negotiating yesterday, buy two today. We paid three fifteen for it. Um, it's near you, like near mm -hmm. you are. Um, I'll write this up just so you have a bit of fun with it. Yeah. Um, um, that, that's over. Oh yeah. One sold last month for three eighty. We picked up to three fifteen. Okay. In Sydney, two better. So wow. yeah, it's pretty good. Cool. Um, cool. So let's read some of these questions. He says, Mel says, so the talk around the world sell now because property prices are going to drop big time. Is that true? I've heard that for decades. Um, you know, there's been times we've just seen massive booms across the country and across the world. Um, but there's still markets around the country where we can buy properties cheaper than what they were 10, 12, 15 years ago. I picked up one this morning in a capital city, right? Like, like in a CBD in Australia for two hundred and sixty thousand. Um, there's a there's a client. They know they bought it. Two hundred and sixty. You bought it. The person's on this live. I can see them here. Uh, two two hundred and sixty thousand, um, and and the owner previously paid three hundred eighty seven for it. 12 years ago. So, you know, that's, and they're renting for like 460 a week, 470 a week. So, um, there is, even though markets have taken off, there's still markets that haven't taken off, and, you know, there's, yeah. there's markets within markets. So, um, before we, <coughs> I've got one more article here, um, and I'm going to show it up, or well, Steve can show it up. Yeah, so this one's, um, this is about a, uh, a young fellow that passed away, um, and then his mum was left to deal with, uh, 
all these assets and he didn't have a will and he had super and he had crypto and uh, he had pets and stuff like that and she was just talking about like the hardship she went through trying to sort yeah. out his um, you know, so, his affairs yeah I've seen so much fuck Steve like, mm. I go on my Facebook and I'll see like rest in peace I've got friends that have like died and shit right like recent years and stuff last few years specifically and it's like fuck you young right like mm. and I'm like are they young or are we getting old right yeah it's a bit They're of both old. Yeah. it's a bit of both right mm. and we don't think about it and um, <clears throat> yeah looking at the 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 situation like if someone has kids doesn't have kids this guy looks like a young bloke it was like yeah. 10 years ago he died or something before yeah. you know the masses yeah. but um with it you may not even own a property right you might be a tenant right and you don't have any assets but if you died and you've got two kids where do the kids go right mm -hmm. do they go to the uncle do they go to the state do they go to the person you wanted to go to yeah. um do they, you know, where do they sit on that front? Um, the, um, when you die, there's like a superannuation mm -hmm. insurance. I think there's a lot of stuff there that, you know, even if like your parents, like we're getting old, our parents are getting older. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, my mum's in her 80s and um, she hasn't been well for a while. She gets like, she got issues, like health issues and stuff. And um, <clears throat> it makes me realize that life is finite and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's important that everyone's on the same page when they, you know, something yeah, happens as a transition. So I think one thing I'd like to cover off on the day, depressing as it sounds, is, uh, you know, is transition of wealth from one generation to another generation, things you can do to prepare that. Yeah. Um, and then all things legal. So, um, so I said they're birchwills.com. <laughs> <laughs> um, now you need a will, you need um, a more stuff than just a will, you need... Um, during guardianship, power of attorney, yeah. there's different things. So we'll get Steve to talk about that. Did a podcast recently with Belinda from Stephen's office as well, talking about these things. So there's more that we can add to that, but we don't want to just focus yeah. on that tonight. Um, and also, you know, it's rare to find a lawyer that A, is a good person, right? I had a real, I had a real estate, just feedback for you. I had a real estate agent a week ago, two weeks ago, um, you'll see that I'll type in the suburb, you'll know where it was. This way. Oh, yeah. He said to me that Stephen, your lawyer, Stephen, is the best lawyer I've dealt with. And this guy's like 50, he's been in the industry for like 25 years. And um, he said that your lawyer, Stephen, he goes, I've never met a lawyer that's got great like, personality and care factor and made sure that everyone was communicated to efficiently. And that's okay, nice really important because um, a minute, a day, um, you know, we've, we've, we've gone to other states to buy properties, right? And Stephen is licensed in multiple states. It's rare to find a lawyer that goes to different states, right? You might have Sydney, New South Wales, and you might have Queensland if you're lucky, and then you wouldn't have New South Wales and Queensland and Perth, and then New South Wales, Queensland, and Perth, and Melbourne, New South Wales, mm. Queens, Melbourne, um, Northern Territory. Like, Stephen looks over most states, um, and you'll be everywhere in the future. Um, but, yeah, that, that communication is very important and, and having a lawyer that understands more because it's a very different case. Or I've seen in those states before you've been able to get there. I'm like on Stephen's ass all the time, like, come on, I need you mm. here, need you here. I'm going to put behind, right? Mm. Like, let's go. And, um, like, deals where the lawyers are just crap and they, 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 don't, they don't even communicate, hey, you're calling off periods coming up, and the people have a risk of getting stuck in a, in a mm. contract without their clauses being met and they're getting action on certain things like pest and building inspection audit, but they've never even been a set of cost agreement from the lawyer. Mm. I think some of these states don't even believe in lawyers. They just set, believe in like settlement agents and shit like that, conveyances. Yeah. And yeah, real estate agents have control over a contract rather mm. than a lawyer. So yeah, on that note, Steve, um, maybe if you can run through just some of the basics of like, you know, what's the difference between a lawyer and a conveyancer just for those that are watching? Yeah, sure. So, um, so a conveyancer can basically take you through the steps of the transaction so they can, um, you know, basically get the property transferred from the seller to the buyer yeah. um, or, or a settlement agent um, over in Perth. Uh, so a solicitor or a, or a lawyer can actually give you legal advice on the contract. Mm -hmm. um, 
and obviously if issues arise and and you need you know advice on on those type of matters and, and if there's defaults and stuff like that your solicitor can sort of handle that if it's a conveyance and if it goes has to go further they probably have to refer it to a, a lawyer or a solicitor um, so you know it's uh, it's just one of those things I mean obviously I'm a solicitor so um, you know my preference is that everyone uses a solicitor um, but uh, yeah stupid if you don't like I'm not well, insulting anyone here um, like if you're trying to say what's the difference between a lawyer and a lawyer and a like you're not expensive for a lawyer. Yeah, like, no, we're pretty we're pretty much on par and like well, if you, you're fifty bucks or if I got a lawyer over a conveyance of it. Yeah, I mean look, you know, you're buying a, an asset, like a, a substantial asset. So yeah. um, it's something that you want to get right and um, yeah, if you get a, a lawyer or a solicitor to take care of it, um, you know, in most cases they can sort of as I said, if something comes up that wasn't in the plan, they can sort of handle that. Um, so yeah, that, that's my preference, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many times <coughs> where things can go bad. Like we had a client, uh, Lisa just sent me a message, we'll catch up, we'll, we'll get on to Lisa's question a little bit later. Uh, Lisa had a, a friend actually that used us and uh, bought a property from us. And um, her friend bought a property, just came to mind, this client, um, this uh, yeah, so I'm going to use this. Brendan just wrote, Hey, Birchie, can Steve give us an example of when he has seen it all go way messy because the solicitor wasn't used? That just kind of ties into the last one. Um, it was a client we had recently bought in a town where the property had gone up like 50 grand in the settlement period. Like, we fucking stole this thing, right? Mm. And the client, the seller goes, Oh, no, I'm not going to sell it to you now, right? Mm. And we're like, No. You're going to sell it to us, right? And my feedback to the client was look, there's a legal obligation there, like just fucking hold into it, like take it, like get it in five years' time, right? Like let's put some caveats on and stuff. And then they spoke to you, Steve, and then you guys had strategy around that. The conveyance would be like, oh, there's too much hard work, just accept their offer and get out of the deal and go Mm. buy another one. Mm. But they would have lost 50k easy from that or even more. Yeah. you were able to drag it to the table and you got them and shook them down. And yes. Yeah. Um, like there's different areas of law that. Yeah, you know, right. But yeah, so, I mean, look, there's, um, you know, there's different areas of, areas of law. And, you know, if it, if it goes to litigation, um, then we've got people that we can get you, you know, to go to court for you if they need to. Yeah. Um, but, like, like, to answer the question, like, we've had matters where, you know, something's gone wrong and they've used, you know, a conveyancer. Uh, and then they've come to us to try and sort it out. So um, we've had quite a few of those, and and it's it's stuff like really, it's actually really simple stuff like what you said before. Like they've missed cool off dates, um, and people didn't have finance, and they're locked into a contract, or um, they've missed um, documents in a contract where, um, like, it's a it's a prescribed document. So if a, a prescribed document is missing in a New South Wales contract, um, potentially that contract could be void. Mm-hmm. So. Um, you know, if you don't get it right, then you're giving an opportunity for the other side to get out of the contract, yeah. um, which sometimes can work in our advantage if we're acting for the buyer in that case. Yeah. Um, but if you're acting for the vendor and you've got an invalid contract, well, then that's not good because then your buyer just walks away. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's why it's, it's important that care is taken, um, that these things are checked. Uh, and I've seen matters where you have, you know, some legal representatives that sort of just do the job, but they miss very important key details, okay. and then that's when things can go wrong. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've, there's only one, so to all the contracts I've ever signed, Steve, there's always this, I've never, ever, ever had any issues. There was one, right? Do you remember mm. the one that I had, which was like, I just went, I got straight from their lawyer, right? Straight mm. from the where they sent it to me, and I was like, oh, push, 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 and it was like, oh, the DocuSign. The DocuSign, mm. but, um, but, you know, there's, we've had some really, like, just me personally, like, there's been, like, things have been able to drag settlements out for years. That one, we even got, like, two years settlement on it, right? Yeah. One of them was, like, five years of settlement, mm. five years of an hour deal that we did, mm. 97 grand. It was, like, yeah. three of us in a bulk deal. Um, so, yeah, and sometimes, like, like, the... Every time you would have seen a deal, like I know I see, but like you as the lawyer and someone else is a conveyancer, do you see those contracts with hold being run circles around the conveyancer and screw the deal however you wish? Um, I mean, look, at the end of the day, 
um, we're trying to keep the deal together, right? So, no, but for protection but, for the client. Yeah, I mean, obviously we see that. So we yeah. see like there's holes in the contract, there's things missing, yeah. uh, there's things that are missed, and then we we obviously will will go back to them and say, look, you've missed this and that, and can we have it? Because it's in our best interest to have all the documents that we need. Yeah. Uh, if it was a different position where you know the client needed to get out of the deal, yeah. um, then we could use that to our advantage. But I yeah. think um, the other thing that people don't sort of um, uh, understand is, I suppose. When you're, you're acting in your best interest of your client, and then um, you know you, you can always negotiate. So you know if something's come up, or, or you want you know you need to negotiate different terms, like we can do that. We can try that. Um, we do it all on a without prejudice basis. Um, whereas if you go to someone else, that might say, well, this is it, and, and that's all you can do. I mean, there's certain you've got limitations, right? So you can't negotiate your way out of anything and everything. Yeah. Um, but when but, it comes yeah. from a lawyer as well, like it comes with more authority too. Like we we get terms that are like really like unheard of. They're like Steve caught up with some people for breakfast in your local area yeah. today, and he saw he saw an agent. He said he saw an agent, mm. and there's an agent. He's like, oh, you, you bought this deal. You got this transaction through this company. Blah blah. Mm. I've heard of your name before, and and it's like I've never seen someone just get price reductions as soon as the test of building's done. Now, yeah, right? it's expected. And everyone knows that Steve's office, it's like, it's not Steve's office, it's like us just pushing yeah. Steve and saying, hey, three grand off, thanks. But it's like, yeah. we're trying for every dollar we can to get off. But it, like the success rate that comes from you, like working on those deals, we have a client that we're talking about beforehand with his block of six units. Mm -hmm. And we've dragged this out for months, right? Mm -hmm. Finance is getting approved. And uh, they're like, we're going to pull out, we're going to do this. And it's like, you've been able to effectively communicate and keep that. They haven't pulled out. They, we're still hanging Touch on. By, <laughs> yeah, we're hanging on by a thread. So um, we'll see what happens with that one. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And um, I've got a few questions coming through here. So Brendan says, if you don't use Stephen, how do you sort a gun solicitor from a want to be gun? <laughs> Is there any. Um, any so I mean, look, if you're if you're looking for someone good, um, I mean, you can always go check out the reviews, right? You can yeah. go on the Law Society website. Um, you can see if they're on the Law Society referral program, yeah. um, stuff like that. Like, you know, and it's important that who has a tool cabinet in their garage, right? Do you, do you have a tool cabinet? Yeah. Steve? You got yeah. a tool? Yeah. yeah. Someone's got a toolbox, everyone, you've got a toolbox in the house, a fucking screwdriver or a hammer <laughs> or whatever, right? Yeah. When you go to the toolbox, right, you're trying to put a, a, a screw in the wall, right, or you're trying to drill a hole, you take a fucking hammer out and hit it, right? You've got a different tool for a different job. Mm. So, Steve and I have a, I have a very good friend of mine who's a lawyer as well, different type of lawyer, and he's a commercial, like a, like a business lawyer, right? Yeah. And um, I've known him to be good with what he does. And then there was a matter which there was like his office dealt with your office, mm. and he didn't know what he was. His office didn't know, right? So he was fantastic at one type of law, mm. but he Stephen ran laps around him when it came to property law, right? Yeah. If you're dealing with a property transaction, a um, you know a, a, a will, a, a business transaction, Stephen's the guy, right? If you're dealing with you know, I don't know, a compo pay up. Yeah. Stephen ain't your guy from no. the compo pay. He'll be the first one that says, hey, I don't do it, right? Yeah. 100%. But a lot of lawyers will go, if you say, I'm an expert in this and that, the next thing, next thing, next thing. Stephen, if it comes to, you know, property, if it comes to rules and estates, yeah. um, planning, estate planning, that's what you specialize in. So. Yeah, that's true. And like, and that's that's what you want. You want someone that's good at what they do, and, and like you said, like if someone comes to me with like a family law matter or a criminal matter, I'd say, look, I'll refer you to someone else, but it's not an area that I take on. Yeah. Um, some solicitors will take on any work, yeah. um, but then that's to the detriment of their client. So, yeah. yeah. And then it's, it becomes sloppy because it's a secondary thing. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. In any industry, you go to somebody that's good at what they do. You're good at what you do. That's yeah. why your clients come to you to find yeah. good properties, good deals. Yeah. Come to me to do a good job with the you know, the legal side of it, do the wills. Yeah. If you go to the doctor, so you go to the general practitioner, right? And then yeah. the general practitioner says, okay, you need to go get a fucking like, x-ray, a blood test, a, a CAT scan, fucking something. And you go off to the specialist, you need a knee doctor, you need a heart doctor, you need a cardiologist, whatever. 
the cardiologist ain't there telling you about, I don't know, um, your dermatology on your foot, right? Yeah. You've got a wart on your toe or something, right? Mm. Like, you're, you need to know that your professional team around you specialise in that, yeah? Yeah. Um, it's so, important. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, whether it be your broker, your buyer's agent, your property yeah. manager, yeah. Um, all of that. So. Um, there's questions there about um, wills and and, uh, and 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 death. Maybe we'll get onto that actually. Like we'll yeah, talk sure. about wills and, and estate planning. Um, and we've got lots of property stuff as well. But I think wills is like really depressing. So we'll do like the <laughs> non-depressing stuff, a bit of depressing stuff. Yeah, and mix it up a bit. Light stuff. Um, so Mel says here, when a parent dies and a step parent has it all tied up in a company, I don't understand that. Um, do you understand that? Maybe I was in the step parent has it all tied up in a company. Um, so if it's a, so when you're talking about companies, so the owners of the company, I don't really know what the question is, but just yeah. generally, um, the owners of a company are the shareholders of the company. Yeah. So um, if if you've got you know one person that owns all the shares in the company, then their shares get passed with their estate. Yeah. Um, so if you're, if you're asking whether you've got a parent and then the step parent's got a company and all the assets are in the company yeah. and it's the step parent that's the sole director and shareholder of that company, yeah. well then all those assets in that company pass under their will. Yeah. So I, I don't know if that was what the question was, but yeah. I've got a question from Lisa here, um, which looks at that. Hi Stephen, when we die and our kids get our properties, one, if there is still debt owing, do they have to sell or can they take over the debt? Uh, but they have to qualify for new loans? Um, yes and yes. So they can, um, if there's a debt still owing, they don't have to sell. So um, if they're the beneficiaries, yeah. then um, if they want to, if you're going to transfer the assets. So normally what happens is when you pass away, um, your assets pass to your beneficiaries without debt. So what would happen is um, you'd have to pay out the debt and then, yeah. um, and then transfer it across. But yeah, if, if your beneficiaries wanted to keep it, um, and if they wanted to go and you know um, get a loan, then they can do that. I have seen um, I have seen two instances um, where people have died, and it like they haven't really informed the bank about it. Like mm. so, it's like you know, a husband and wife one yeah dies, and then the other one um, has the loan, and it's still mm -hmm. a bank. As far as we're aware, like the loans like probably, probably twenty years ago. Yeah, is paying itself down. So that may be of I don't know that the risk is attached to that, but they may not have told the bank that the person's yeah. deceased for that. But. So normally, with um, so if you're using that example where you've got a husband and wife, yeah. and the husband passes away, yeah. and if they'll, they own the property as joint tenants, um, it's basically right of survivorship. Yeah. So then we go ahead and lodge a notice of death, and you don't have to get consent from the bank. You okay. just lodge a notice of death, um, the property gets transferred, the husband's share goes to the wife. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, if she then can't continue paying it off, yeah. then it just goes down the normal course of like, she can't pay it off. And, yeah. and I've seen mail for people, which has been in like, there's been like maybe three people that own, and then one other person died like 25 years ago or so, and they're just still on there, like I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that, that's not uncommon either. Um, yeah. It's usually one, we usually find out, like you'll get clients that come to you and um, it'll be the last surviving one, right? Yeah. So we had one where there was like, three siblings and the last one came and the property was in third shares each and yeah. and so the, the last one just passed away and I'm like, oh, what about the first one? And like you said, they passed away 10 years ago wow, okay. and nothing was done. Um, so then, yeah, you still have to go through probate, but there's just a, a, another procedure. It's a bigger issue. Yeah, yeah it's a bit, it takes a bit longer, costs a bit more money. Um, but yeah, absolutely, you should tie up all your, um, all your affairs. If someone passes away, um, get your affairs in order. It'll just make it easier for the rest of your family um, to sort out. Um, do they have to pay taxes at the time? Um, so do the, the beneficiaries have to pay taxes? Yeah. No. But if they then sell it, um, then they might be like, then they would be liable for like you know, capital gains tax or whatever. But if your parents bought a property before 1985, it wouldn't be liable, would it? Then if they bought it before 86, which was a pre capital yeah. gains tax asset, yeah. um, I believe, and I haven't looked this up because I don't do tax, but I believe once it transfers to the beneficiary, they then become the owner, they've acquired the asset post CGT, so then when they sell it, it's the, the value of the date that, it, that they acquired it. 
what was it worth? The day yeah. was, I can say like it's a million dollar house. Let's say mum and dad bought the house for a hundred grand in 1980. Yeah. And they cast it now. Mm -hmm. And then they, um, you like how I yeah, talk, yeah. how I talk like, <laughs> I talk a layman's term, right? Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, like, yeah. So uh, the parents pass in 2024, the thing's worth a million bucks, they own nothing on it, got zero debt, mm -hmm. paid a hundred, it's worth a million bucks. What would, and I, I go, well, I've just inherited it two weeks ago, and I want to sell it today, what would be the implication then? Without so, giving tax advice. Yeah, so again, this isn't, sort of my area, but if you inherit the property and it's worth a million dollars and then you sell it for a million, two years, you sell it for a million, for a million, well then there's no capital gains tax anyway because you've just sold, sold it for what it's worth. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. cool. But, but if, if you I sold it, five years, yeah. it would be capital gains tax on what it's worth from the day. That's my understanding. Okay, yeah. cool. So just check that with your account. Fantastic. They're very good questions to ask actually. Mm. I would never have thought these questions to ask it, so yeah. yeah. Um, There's a funny question. I love, I love the um, the, uh, the funny comments there. Uh, someone says here, uh, signing and scanning a new contract as I watch this. It's a hustle, mate. It's, uh, it's great. Um, and other questions here. <coughs> no more questions at the moment. So keep the questions coming. Um, so tell me, Steve, <coughs> if we have a like you have a will, everyone knows what a will is, and if people don't know what a will is, what is a will? What, what's the benefit of a will? Yeah, so a will is just um, a legal document um, that outlines um, who your representative is going to be when you pass away, so your executor, yeah. and how you want your assets distributed um, after your death. So, yeah. And how complex can that be and how easy can it be? Like? Yeah, however, however easy or however complex you want it to be. So yeah. I'm a big fan of plain English wills um, that just sort of, you know, you draft them so they make sense to you. There's yeah. no point coming to me to draft a will. I draft it, you read it, and you don't understand it. Yeah. Um, so we like to draft them in a way that's easy to understand. It's plain English. Um, so yeah. And some of the people will say like, "Oh, I can get a will for like a hundred dollars on the internet or that." Like, yeah. really, the will. You don't want something that's going to be contested either, because like if some if you've got a will that's done wrong or not executed rightly or mm. you know, incorrectly, then you're screwed. Like. For whatever it's worth, like I know that for wills, like the different pricing, different mm -hmm. complexities, and all that sort of stuff. But they like if we were to say this may have a number of a thousand bucks, this may have a number of mm -hmm. the grand, like that's like an insurance policy on your whole life's worth of hard work to make sure that it yeah. goes in the right places, your kids are looked after, mm -hmm. you know, you've got a young child, where do they go to, what sort of um, you know, funds do they get looked after? Stay and all that sort of stuff. So, yep. um, besides that, like we touched on beforehand, the enduring guardianship and the power of attorney, can we explain what and yeah. how they're used for? Yeah, sure. So, um, your enduring guardianship is a document that you draft up um, that you nominate somebody else to make decisions about, you know, your health, um, lifestyle, consent to surgery, that sort of stuff. If you can't make decisions for yourself, so that's only whilst you're still living. Yeah, but you can't make the decision yourself, so you nominate um, a guardian to make that decision. Yeah. And then your power of attorney is um, uh, a document that you appoint someone to uh, manage your finances if you lose capacity and you can't manage your finances. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So, and, and, and quite often, like you'll see like a sale, and it might be like an auction or some bullshit sale that's like mm -hmm. you know cheap or whatever. And also like public trustee and stuff like that. So if you don't have a will and you don't have an executor or a, a like power of attorney or a during guardianship, and I don't know, you're 80 and you're frail and you've got to go to a nursing home, what happens with the, like, there's no one to look after you, what happens to mm. you then? Like, does it go to the state who makes a decision? Yeah, so, um, so just first, like your will only comes into play after you die. Yeah. And your power of attorney and your enduring guardianship are only valid whilst you're living. Yeah. So as soon as you pass away, those documents are no longer valid and it's the will that's valid. Yeah. But, what, um, but whilst you're alive, it's only those documents and not the will. So um, if you're like, you know, if you're in a situation where, um, yeah, like you said, you're, you're unwell and you need to go into a care facility um, and you, do, you haven't nominated a guardian or, or an attorney, um, then essentially, you know, you leave it up to the government, they step in, 
um, they can appoint a financial manager for you yeah. um, and they can appoint a guardian for you and it's usually a government body uh, and then they will you know sort your finances out and, and look yeah. after you supposedly <laughs> yeah. just put a bucket on go zoom into the camera and put my head on right nothing fucking good comes from when the government control <laughs> your shit right um, they don't they don't do good when they take your money and build your roads. They don't do good when they, you know, put their finger in any part of your life. So you can either take control of it whilst you've got the ability to, or you can leave it up to the state to, yeah. you know, do it yeah. then. So Mel said here, how do I get a copy of the will? Um, so what? if she's made a will, um, yeah. usually what happens is we keep the original in our safe. Yeah. And we give you a copy to keep at home. Yeah. So if you don't have a copy, then just go back to the law firm that drafted the will and ask them for a copy. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so yeah, with it, um, we've got Monica here, another lawyer. It's a yeah. uh, property lawyer. I don't know if you know Monica or not. No. Okay, cool. She's, um, she does a lot of stuff in the space as well. Um, but with it, um, you know, I think it's very important. And I don't know if Mel is saying, um, like, how do you get a copy of the will? Like, say if someone died and they had a will and you're like a beneficiary, like if a parent or mm -hmm. what would happen? Let's say yeah. you haven't spoken to your parent or your sibling or whatever yeah. and they die. How do you know which lawyer to go to or anything like yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. So, like, when, when you're drafting a will, you nominate an executor. And, yeah. an, and a backup executor, so the executive is your legal representative. And when you draft, when you make the will, we we tell you that you need to notify your executors that you've made a will, yeah. and where the original is. So if you came and made a will, I'd say, you know, make sure you tell them. So Mel, Mel said, how do we have a copy of it? Yeah. Oh, okay, right. So, <clears throat> so how do you get a copy of your dad's will? So, um, if you if you fall under a category of um, of persons that are entitled to a copy of the will of the deceased, yeah. then <clears throat> As long as you know where it is, then you can go and request a copy and they have to provide you with a copy. If you don't know where it is, yeah. um, then it's probably a good idea to keep an eye out on the, um, um, there's like an online registry yeah. of like, uh, say if you apply for a grant of probate, um, you have to put in an ad to say that, you know, if anyone's making a claim uh, is executor, please yeah. contact us. So if you keep a regular eye on that, then you'll see if someone's making application for yeah. probate and then potentially you can contact them and get a copy of the will. Yeah. I've, I've seen something, I told you that scenario that happened about a year ago, I asked you about a relative oh, yeah. of mine, yeah, that right. same sort of thing that happened where no one had contacted, it was like an estranged father that, mm. you know, then remarried and then, you know, mm. this new family all, you know, walking the house, taking the house and, you know, yeah, mm. it was pretty crazy. Yeah. So when and also like when you say um, I'm assuming which says how do I get a copy of my dad's will I'm assuming dad's passed away because yeah. obviously you don't have any entitlement to get a copy of someone's will if they're still living yeah um, but if they've passed away you know, if you know you know where it is then you can potentially um, yeah get a copy yeah so I think um, you know like if you if your dad may have had a lawyer or that like that could be a good like. You know, yeah, people absolutely. Like being a lawyer, that they're like, I've used my lawyer for so many years. That could be another place to go. Hey, yeah, you know. and most most people keep a copy of their will at home with their records, so they might have a copy at home, and yeah. on the copy it'll say, you know, the law firm that drafted it, and then you can contact them, and uh, and you can request. Um, well, obviously, if you've got a copy, you can request. If you're not the executor, whether the executor's contacted them, and yeah. if any steps have been taken in relation to distributing the estate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sue. Um, so we've got a couple more questions, and then I think we'll get out of um, death and wills because it is pretty depressing. It's not mm. something I want to talk about, right? It's uh, mm. people coming for a, a laugh and to learn about property and investing, but it's all, yeah. yeah, it's all important. Like people take insurance policies on their car and all that sort of stuff, but mm. this is your life's work, and your kids and your you know, grandkids, and you know, all the yeah, you want to provide for them, yeah. So Matt says here, hypothetical if parents pass and leave the property to one, to two siblings, one sibling wants to keep the property and the other wants the cash, can you get a property change to go to one sibling? So normally in, like in a situation like that, um, 
we've got one sibling that wants to keep the property and the other one wants to sell it. Um, so the first thing we normally recommend is um, to ask if the, the one that wants to um, keep it, if they'd be happy to buy the other sibling out. So yeah. then we'd get a valuation done yeah. uh, or get a couple of valuations and then you know you go for the, for the average price and then you buy them out. So you want to keep it, you buy them out. Uh, that's, that's how it's normally done. If, um, if you can't come to an agreement on what you want to do, then if you're the beneficiaries, so you'll both be on title of that property as beneficiaries, yeah. And if that just comes down to um, if you're both on title of a property, one wants to sell and one doesn't, if you can't come to an agreement, you can go to court and get an order from the court to force the sale. So Matt just goes to buy out the other sibling, you have to pay the stamp. You, you, you would have to, um, to do that. Um, however, it depends on what stage you're at with yeah. the distribution of the estate. So is the person deceased or not deceased? Is it something you discuss prior to the death? or the passing of the person, like to say, hey, can you put in the will? Put in the will that what? I say, for instance, I don't know, we, we're brothers, right? Mm -hmm. We've got mum and dad's house, and it's worth a million bucks, and that owes nothing, right? Mm -hmm. I want to keep the house, and you don't want the house, or vice versa, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a half a million dollars for each of us when we sell the property. If we go to mum and dad and say, hey, can we, I, you know, one of us want to keep the house and the other wants to get the cash, can you just put the house in my name, right, and get the will drawn up to reflect that and then reflects inside the will that I have to pay you $500,000 so it doesn't pass through mm. to me. Would that be something? Um, it would. The only thing there is there's the uncertainty with the values, like you don't know when they're going to pass away. Yeah. So you don't want to have fixed values in the will of what you're going to leave. This property yeah. might be worth a lot more. Two mil. And, yeah. Right, so yeah. that, that's one issue. but. Um, if you if it's come to the like pre-distribution of the assets or sorry before like the person's passed away yeah. um, you can come to an arrangement with the other beneficiaries and do what's called like a deed of family arrangement yeah where you can actually change how the, the assets are to be distributed if all the beneficiaries agree okay um, so that's one that's one way that you can do Could it be double stamped or not well if if it's a deed of family arrangement then that would change the beneficiaries so then um, it would go through probate yeah. and then it would come through as if that you were the beneficiary or you weren't the beneficiary. Okay. So it's be, it would normally be nominal stamp duty, but it'd be payable. Okay. Cool. Um, Monica just said, with the pre-G, you cover against tax if you sell within two years of acquisition, then it stays at pre-G. That sounds right. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Two lawyers on the same page. Um, so we've got here, what happens if the lawyer dies before you? Ha, ha, ha. So uh, that's why you need a young, fit, and healthy lawyer, someone like Stephen. <laughs> I don't think that's what they're asking. <laughs> I think they're saying like if your if your lawyer dies before you, so like if they're holding your original will, yeah, and then what I, happens to your will? You need a new, you need a younger lawyer. Like you don't <laughs> want a, a a white man in a suit with a you know that's 75, 80 years old, right? Mm. You know the types. You know the, the, yeah. the old mates from the city. Mm. Um, <laughs> that that um that would. You know, those guys, it's like, is it best? Like, should you be finding yourself some new, um, yeah, someone just know that interesting. Yeah. So, like, I actually do get that asked that question. What's that? Like, like, say, if someone makes a will and I have the original in our safe and they say, well, what happens if something happens to you or if you, you know, you move or, or you know, the business yeah. goes, whatever. So, normally what happens is all the original wills that you hold or that your lawyer holds in their safe custody, they would write to the... Um, to the clients and say, you know, the firm's going to be merging and we're going to be taking the wills with us to this firm or, you know, the business is, you know, closing down and if we don't hear from you within a certain period of time, um, they'll be going to this place. So yeah. you will be notified. And Greg, if you're after that, right guy here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so that's, uh, you know, it uh, depends on, on, on the preference. So, yeah. Um, so we've got another few questions here. Um, one more question here. Um, hey Nathan, do you think a very old house with big land is still going to be worth something because building costs is going through the roof? I've got, so the question is, is a big house and big land, like people think their land goes up, the house goes down in value. People never knew what inflation was until the last few years. I've been laughing and saying about it and 
you know, having fun with the conversation for many, many years now. And I think people are starting to understand that the property itself, the building is the value. You can derive and squeeze value from development, but as a lazy perspective, you know, the asset just goes up with inflation. So for me, I'm looking at like, see if you, you know, that you sort of like, you know, who was the lady, the, the lovely lady that worked for you a few years ago as like a legal assistant? Um, mm. And she helped me settle those properties on the freeway. And she used to look at every time I'd buy one. She's That's like, right, yeah, oh, Tammy. Like, Tammy, yeah. yeah. So Tammy would sit there and she's like, oh, and I'd buy a property. I've got like an acre in the middle of Southport and, you know, in the Gold Coast, in the heart of the Gold Coast. And she'd always see, she's like, I know which one Nathan's buying now. Mm. He's bought another one to connect into this side. Yeah. I was buying these houses for 500 grand. And like today, the house is worth a million bucks. I'm sure, they've doubled. But the units have gone from 200 to 600. Right, in the same area. So it's like, did the house really perform? If I build a block of 50 units or 100 units combined together and all that sort of stuff, yeah, well, there's more value there, but then I have to do this hard work, I have to go to the DA, I have to go to the building, I have to go to all this stuff. So <clears throat> if they were just individual houses that have gone from 500,000 to a million, yeah, they've got up 500 grand, yeah, they've made money, yeah, they've doubled. But my units and townhouses and villas that I was buying for 150, 200, they're selling for five, 600,000, they're a much better investment than that specific house. So the old adage of house versus unit, I think the same thing applies there. Prashant has asked, can you talk a bit about finance clauses? Um, it seems to not be a thing in New South Wales, contracts especially. So mm -hmm. what is a finance clause and how does it work? Yeah, so um, essentially the finance clause is just when you enter a contract subject to obtain finance approval to be able yeah. to complete the purchase. Um, so in every state they're slightly different. Um, we don't use them a great deal in New South Wales because in New South Wales... There's no such thing. Yeah, no, we, we usually either exchange contracts by the real estate agent with a cooling off period mm -hmm. and the cooling off period is for the purpose of getting your finance formally approved mm -hmm. um, or we do an unconditional exchange and you get your finance approved before that. Yeah, every state is, is totally different. Queensland, I think, is the best. Mm. Queensland's got the best because we put all these stupid clauses in there, like, we've never had anyone lose any money, like, not even a dollar because, you know, they get the deposit back because they yeah. pull out on the due diligence. There's lots of parachutes you can add in. Mm. Uh, in Perth and Melbourne, like Melbourne, Victoria, like, they want to see specifically, did you lodge your finance application on that date? So if there's an issue, with you lodging finance because you're trying to pull equity from another deal and you're two weeks to wait till your finance mm -hmm. gets submitted, they can try and knock you on the head. So it's important that the law, like before you went to Melbourne, Steve, we were using, we used like maybe three lawyers we went through in Melbourne and it was fucking painful and they were all of my clients were like, oh, we want Stephen, right? We want, we want like, can, can Stephen help us? And I'm like, mm -hmm. he can't, mate. He's not licensed there yet, right? It's like coming to Melbourne. Um, these lawyers are like wild, wild west. It's like, it's like the, the, talking about wild, wild west in Western Australia, the, it's not just the time that's backwards over there. There's a lot of processes mm. and people that are too. So, um, yeah. It's, like, it's um, yeah, they're, they're, they're different in every state. And um, I mean, I'm a big advocate of a due diligence clause. Like in New South Wales, we have a cooling off period, right? So you can pull out for whatever reason. You don't have to give a reason. You can pull yeah. out. You do forfeit 0.25%. Cost you cover charge, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but in the other states, um, if, if you don't, you know, if you've only got a finance clause and a pest and building clause, um, sometimes it's it's quite restricted. So, um, yeah. Cool. Um, so the next question is, the comment here was, I love inflation, it's a magic potion for our freedom when we hold assets. Exactly. It's, uh, it depends on, like, inflation is working for people out there mm -hmm. because they're paying out their debt with devaluing currency, and that's how the world goes around. But um, unfortunately, a lot of people don't have assets, so they're not benefiting from inflation. Mm -hmm. um, Matt says, what's the longest you've stretched out a finance clause, Steve? <laughs> Probably a couple of months. We probably had like maybe two, two to three months. Um, it doesn't happen. Probably. Doesn't it happen very often. But it if does it? Or? No. What's no. what's the average one gets extended out? Um, so we get three weeks. Yeah, usually three weeks. Um, and half of them get extended by a week or two. Yeah. Three weeks. Yeah. yeah. Maybe like a month. Two months on average. Mm. One and a half months. Yeah. Yeah. It just depends on the. Yeah. What's the longest settlement you've had? 
oh, the years like we've had, well, your ones probably, they're always, you know. I had a pub, I bought a pub and a gold, I'm not saying it, that bloke, kind of got me stuck in a contract and uh, we went in and out and cat and mouse and suing, not suing and like taking back to the table, renegotiate, mm -hmm. get better terms and um, that took a few years like reading out of that deal and then um, there was um, there was that Nara deal, that Nara, we made them subdivide the property and we bought it and mm -hmm. literally walked it through a market so it was like three years I reckon. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, cool. so, yeah. Yeah. And then this is something like this is not normal, right? This is not normal. I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, contracts are not just two dimensional, right? Mm -hmm. And I can't do this. So before anyone asks, I shouldn't fucking say it. Sometimes I let can of worms out, right? But it's live, so let's just throw mm -hmm. it out there. Um, I've done deals which have been like. Um, Convertible leases and, and mm -hmm. different things like that. So you could rent a property for five years and then in five years it turns into a sale and mm -hmm. at the end of that you acquire it. So I look at it that I'm basically making the the property, the, the vendor of the property, um, that, um, you know, if, if I'm making that vendor the bank. So I put down 10% deposit and then I'll rent it for two years or five years and I know I've got the control over it the vendor's in a very tough spot at the time, they take my offer. It only works with shit properties, shit locations, commercial properties, like the specifics that will happen, but I've probably done that like 20 times or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Monica says, what about a nominee clause and or nominee? Yep, so in Victoria, yep. um, that's permitted. Um, it's, it's specific in their contracts that you can have a nominee. Yeah. Um, in other states, not so much. So at common law, you can probably do a nomination, but um, in other states, there can be stamp duty implications for that as well. So in most, or well, in New South Wales, Queensland, um, we don't generally do nominee clauses. Yeah. Uh, but in Victoria, it's um, it, it's specific. Yeah, you can do it okay. there. Yeah. As I've seen, people have done it before, but like it does come with the risk as well attached to. Yeah, like if you put, you know, Double the scale. buyer is someone and or nominee and then yeah. um, depends on, you know, there's, I think there's a few revenue rulings out there about it as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you just got to be careful with that because there's no, there's not a strict provision in the contract for it. Yeah. It might be permissible at, at common law, but, you know, yeah. Brendan says, how does Stephen stretch out finance clauses in a hot market? So I might jump in. Yeah, and I know. You, you, yeah. you can tie, tie it off. Um, so, it's just... Communication is very crucial um, in keeping that deal together. So, uh, communicating with the agent, saying, hey, it's all looking good, just need an extra week, right? So, we go, oh, we need three weeks extension, right? Steve gets mm -hmm. it, I know it's going to be fucking rejected straight away. I'm like, finance told you need three weeks, just ask for a week. Don't ask for three, they're going to tell you to piss off. Um, you might have to give them something, so you might satisfy due diligence, you might satisfy pest and building. Um, it's how you time it, how you communicate it, um, what you're actually asking for, depending on the, the seller of the property. Mm -hmm. um, they don't normally just come back straight at the first time you ask for it, they don't normally say no. Um, in, it depends, like, yeah. yeah, so it just really depends. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, you can use it as a negotiation tool, like in New South Wales, sometimes we, you know, we might offer to pay another, an additional, yeah, yeah. As, towards a non-refundable portion. Um, we've dragged them out, we've dragged out cooling off periods for like three months in Sydney where we've had to drop in a second, like after two months they're not like, they're like we've extended this now for six weeks on top of the original two mm. weeks, you guys are fucked or whatever. And then we're like, look, it's going through, we're confident of it, we just need to wait for the final little bit. It's because of finance, it's mm -hmm. always finance, mm -hmm. we need to push through. Um, We'll show you a sign of commitment. So sometimes, what I'll suggest, I had one the other day, do you remember the, the, the little 100 grand property that we had, right? Mm -hmm. The loop, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's like a 100 grand property. And um, the um, I said to the, we couldn't get a cooling off, the previous buyer pulled out because of something with the property. And um, I said to them, let's put in there 
a 10 percent deposit so we offer to pay 10 percent deposit only 10 grand because only 100 grand property but that's refundable because we're still in the finance clause so we've got two weeks with the finance clause but we gave them a 10 percent deposit so that person that's selling it is oh this person's serious they've given us the 10 grand mm. without really looking at the depth of it and going okay i can get rug pulled to it mm. so it's just giving the comfort to the person who's like okay and i think in states where you've got the finance clause in place if that's what you're extending, they're going to lose the thousand buck deposit anyway. Like it's got to go back if they pull mm. out, then the finance, the, the finance and the money goes back. They're like, shit. Well, I'll just wait out. I've already waited three weeks. What's another two weeks? What's mm. another one week on top? So yeah, yeah. you just got to be mindful with um, pulling out under the finance clause that they can request evidence. <coughs> so and it, again, it's different in every state. So some states they don't require it. Some states. Some states specifically require you to provide evidence before you can even pull out under finance. Yeah. Um, so that that's something you need to consider as well. Yeah, I've noticed. I've noticed that some states, there's two states, um, yeah. that, are, that are more specific on that than others. Michael says, "Hey mate, hey Nath, uh, how many investment properties did you have before you got your first principal place of residence, and how were you able to keep getting a lot more after you got your principal place of residence?" Um, I might share a story of my principal place of residence uh, onto my third principal place now, third, um, fourth, third. And um, the first one I bought, I paid 1.2 million for 1.19 million, got a $956,000 loan. I still own that property, it's worth about five mil, and um, I just keep it for any banking exercise. Um, and it's still deemed as my principal place of residence. and. Um, I remember when I bought it, I could rent it for 600 bucks a week, and I thought to myself, shit, if I ever got myself into trouble, I've got an 8% interest rate on a 956 grand loan, that's like seven grand a month, six grand a month, that's like 12, 1500 bucks a week in repayment, 600 bucks ain't gonna cut the cheese, right? So I thought, shit, I'd be, if I had to rent it out, things would be bad, so then I'd have to come up with still another 800 or 1000 bucks a week. So I went to all my properties, I pushed my rent up, $10 here, $20 there, 30 bucks here, 40 bucks there, whatever, and I ended up getting 30 properties up about you know, seven, 800 bucks a week. And I was like, well, if I got in the worst position, I had to rent it out, it would still be similar sort of mm. position to where I am today. Um, so that's where I bought my first one. I sold my first house I ever bought to buy my first principal place of residence. Uh, my second one, um, I bought using vendor finance for the deposit. So I vendor financed the, the they, they wanted um, 2.2 for that. And, um, I offered them one point, they wanted 2.5, offered them um, 1.8, just being smart ass, and that was before the last boom of Corona, like, it was like maybe 2019, and um, it took me about a year to exchange it, and to get the stars aligned for it, because I was doing a few other things at the time, um, pushing myself constantly, and um, and I, I knew I'd come with the capital, but it was like I had the funds used elsewhere. So I threw down a property as a security, like a first mortgage, over a, a thirty thousand dollar property I bought. They were happy with that. I said, "Listen, my um, my deposit of um, four hundred. I, I said to them, I'll pay you one point eight. They came from two point five to two point two. I said, listen, I will pay your money, but I'll pay you 1.8 now, but I'll pay the other 400,000 at 100 grand every six months for the next two years, right? And you want your money, I'll give you your money, but I want my terms. So that's how I got my second property. I just paid 100 grand every six months, so I cash flowed my way through that to get to my second one. And for my third one where I live now, that was four mil, and I sold off the property. So I, I initially negotiated the deal. I moved into it. I got a six month, rental baked into the purchase. I paid them the 10% deposit. And then I, so I saved up the 400 and then I put in um, to settle it. I sold off like about a half dozen properties. And some of these things are paid for like 300 grand. I owed 200 grand on them. And then uh, I bought them like 10 years ago and never stepped foot in them. Sold them off for like 1.2, ended up with like a million bucks in the bank account. You know, a few of those things happened. And I got the principal place of residence, and I thought to myself, if someone had to go and buy that property, the interest bill would be like if you just if you never paid interest and just paid mm. fifty grand a year, that'd take eighty years to pay for that, right? Mm. But if it wasn't for the decisions that I made ten years prior by having the assets, I had more triggers that I could pull to yeah. make that happen. So 
it's never been easy like to get to that next stage. It's always been like a, a hurdle or an obstacle and, and all that. And Steve sees it every day because he's like, fuck, like he's like too scared. I sit on my <laughs> I sit on my Perth office, right? I bought my Perth office like eighteen months or two years ago mm. and I did a lease on it for two years. It was only like three hundred grand, I paid for like a hundred grand, but I don't do loans, so I bought it cash. And Steve's like, Oh, you've got like a pub settling, this settling, there's like Five different things settling. I've got like three settling next month. They're coming up now, Dave, and I'm mm. like, I'll sort it out. And I just, Steve was scared because I was, I had enough shit going on that week. Mm. And I said, Hey, Steve, I'm just letting you know I've just sent you 300,000 to settle the thing. And he said, No, well, you called me within like a fucking minute. Yeah. I said, You called me that fast. Like, Is that real what you just sent me? <laughs> like, <laughs> I was in disbelief. I was like, Yeah. That's good. The hustle is always a hustle. And you know, it doesn't matter if you've got one or you've got 10 or you've got 20 or 50. It's like, but when you rock up to get that bill to live in, it's like most people have two options. They've got the husband's income, the wife's income. We're in 2024, it could be anyone's income, right? You've got mm. two people's, two persons' incomes, right? Yeah. <laughs> so looking at, you, you've just got one or two options. But when I rock up or you rock up or one of my investors rock up, you've got your income, you've got you know, spouse's income, you've got a business income, you've got two other businesses income, you've got like 10 pro- rental properties, you've got three other properties over here. You can go, well, oh, if I just get rid of that, I can swap this over. I had a podcast with someone that's very dear to me, um, you know, the person, like she's been working for me for 12 years, you know, mm-hmm. you saw in the car park the mm-hmm. before, we did a podcast, and um, I put her into a castle, she lives in a castle, right? Uh, we should be on a podcast soon, so I won't spill all the beans there. But um, I told her to sell a three bedroom red brick house, two investment properties I bought for this is 10 years ago. I bought her a castle, that thing's like four times worth it is. In a fucking amazing position. So mm. yeah, it's just those little moves. It's, it's a chessboard. It's like, what can you do? So, yeah, as for how many properties, like, I was at like, I remember when I moved into my first principal place, I, um, I, I remember carrying boxes and moving them in, and they're clear boxes with all the newspapers. I collect newspapers from the newspapers. It was like one day I'm gonna have kids. They're gonna be like, "Dad's fucking old loser, right?" I don't know. It's pretty cool. Look at me. I was a poster boy, right? And then I remember looking at it. It's like the Donald Trump of Australia. Donald Trump of Mount Julius. This guy's got like a hundred properties, and I laughed because I'm like, "I've got a hundred properties. I'm moving my own shit into my first principal place of residence." From like all my tenants in Mount Druid paid for me to live on the other side, right? Mm. It's, yeah, so yeah. Um, <laughs> Berkshire, did you just identify as a transgender on a live, right? Absolutely not. I know my position, I know my position well, and uh, yeah, so, and it's not that, right? I'm very comfortable. There's some things I'm uncomfortable about in life, but that is not one of them. Um, there's a whole other scenario, right? Imagine what we could talk about with that, Steve. We haven't gone into legalities. Mm-hmm. What happens if you change your gender whilst you own the property? There's a good one. Um, as long as you don't change your name, it probably doesn't make too much difference. If you change your name... They normally do. I've seen even females called Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> if, um, they didn't teach that one in law school. No, they didn't, no. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's another one. <laughs> Why are we facing these questions? Um, uh, what are the questions? Uh, what information and documents are required from the buyers before you start working with them? Like, say, say if someone wants to, if I want to use you today for the first time, mm-hmm. what would what would some of those things yeah. that you need? So, um, so normally we get. Um, Depending on where you're buying, we usually get like a portion of our fees paid in. We get uh, a portion of our disbursements, which is so we can order some searches for the states where we have to order searches where they're not in the contract. Um, you have to do a verification of identity, um, which can be done sort of online now. Um, you have to, there's some other client authorizations and other forms you have to sign. You have to confirm that you're Australian or you're a citizen or a permanent resident and there's forms for that too. Uh, otherwise you have to pay extra stamp duty. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's onboarding. The VOI is only once, yeah? Just once, yeah. Because yeah. I, I never did it. I'm like, 
I had to, I had to do transactions with other lawyers, Steve. Like I've had to go to like other places before we get there, right? I'll be mm. there before you're there, right? Yeah. And I'm like, are you fucking serious? I'm going to go and hold up a video of myself or a photo. I was like, get out of here, right? Like, it's just, <laughs> Stephen doesn't do that for me, but it's because you've already That's got yours. Right, so. already got yours, yeah. Yeah. Cool, and um, I guess like some of the basics, right? Like title searches and strata reports and stuff like that. Like, what would be the checks that you'd suggest for people to do and make sure they don't skip out on? When buying yeah, yeah, complex? for sure. Um, so, yeah, definitely if you're buying in a strata complex to get a strata report. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, New South Wales... Um, 100% you should get it because there's no strata disclosure in the contract. Yeah. Um, Queensland, they do have a disclosure statement. That yeah. depends on how comprehensive it is, depending on you know which property you're buying. Um, and yeah, same with WA. Um, WA are somewhat more comprehensive, mm-hmm. but we still get recommend we get strata reports because there could be something that's been missed, um, and if it comes up in the strata report, we want to be aware of it before you get locked into the contract. I bought the office in Melbourne, and. Um yeah, in that, like, trying to get strata reports from Melbourne, it's yeah. like, they're a fucking joke. Yeah, they, um, so in, in Victoria, they've got, um, they've got a, like a, what we call it, like a, it's a vendor statement that has, um, uh, it's got strata disclosure documents in there, yeah. but again, um, you know, we don't know how comprehensive they are, we don't know if they're up to date, um, so we still do recommend that we get a strata report. Um, okay. Piston building is a must. Yeah. Um, and also, if you're buying like a house, um, usually we recommend like to get a survey done. But if you don't want to go to the expense, because they can be quite expensive, um, you can get a um, like a Stuart Title Insurance policy for a couple hundred bucks. That depends on the on the price of the property. Um, I think it's a better option. Yeah, and then you're protected for like you know any encroachments, um, any defects, uh, in, sorry, unapproved structures and stuff like that. So it's funny you say that. We started the conversation today with conveyances versus lawyers, right? I once had a property that I bought, you didn't look after it many, many moons ago, and um, I think we sold it, right? Mm-hmm. But we didn't know, I never knew what happened. The new person bought it, but it wasn't a legal house, right? It was just a vacant block of land and you shouldn't have dwellings on it, right? It was just a paper lot that I bought. Mm-hmm. And someone bought this thing, lived in it, and then came back and oh, you sold me a thing. And this is like, I bought it, I sold it for like, Forty thousand or fifty thousand dollars in Marsden Park, two seven six five in Sydney. Right, go look at Marsden Park and say where can I buy for forty five thousand or whatever. And um, this person, the conveyance did no checks, and the house was only just planted somewhere in the bush. We thought it was a house. I bought it as a house, mm. but then this conveyance didn't do any checks, and the house was like on a potential road in the future. Right, mm. and so like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so definitely if you're not going to yeah. get a survey done, get a Stuart Title Insurance policy. Yeah. yeah. I think it's much cheaper than the insurance, especially if you got properties for like 200 grand or whatever. Yeah, like, it yeah. Is. Oh, yeah. I've never done that. I've never done that. that uh, survey. The survey, yeah. You know, like yeah, it's not my thing. Um, cool. And um, like, what about like land taxes and shit like that? Like say, for instance, obligations that fall in to make sure the contracts adjusted so there's any tax liabilities if they don't come in settlement. Like, what if you buy and pay for my council rates for five years? I see mm-hmm. people, sometimes they get scared. I've, I've seen people get scared. Like, every second strata property is in a right? Like, mm-hmm. the, like the, the, the person that owns the property. They're not paid up in advance. They're like a month behind, a quarter behind. Some people like a year behind. Generally, if you're buying a property cheap and we're getting a desperate sale, they're probably selling because they're in financial hardship. Mm. So the strata might be like not paid for a year, right? They're fucked. They've got the strata company chasing them. So sometimes people get scared. They're like, oh no, the strata's not paid, right? And it's like, when it settles, it'll get paid. Mm. It'll be up to scratch. So yeah. oh yeah, but there's... So what happens, like, if, if I haven't paid my strata or I'm selling it, does the other person have to pay my strata? Or no. How does that work? No, so the standard clauses in, in almost all the contracts say that, you know, any arrears or outstanding balances for council rates, water rates, strata levies, um, they need to be paid out at settlement. We do adjustments, so you adjust for the current period. Um, there might also be an adjustment for land tax, uh, yeah. depending on which state you're buying in. Um, but any arrears would normally have to be paid out at settlement, so it has to be paid from the... From the sale proceeds, so basically, when you become the owner, you get a clean slate. Yeah, cool, awesome. Yeah, 
Um, is there any um, anything else that you think we should cover off on of today? Um, so, from a buyer's perspective, yeah, just to um, you know get advice on the contract that you're um, for, for the property that you're purchasing. Um, do all the recommended checks, um, and then you know once you're in a position to proceed. You've got all the information. You can make an informed decision whether it's a good purchase for you, um, and then you can you can move forward from there. So yeah, have all the searches done. Have all the right clauses in the contracts to protect you. Yeah, yeah. So when we do the contracts for our clients, so we with a team that put together the contracts, send it over, whatnot. Um, with that, like we've loaded them up with clauses to protect you know, like the, the purchaser. I was going to say the investor, but the purchaser. Um, so like finance clauses and that sort of stuff, um, but yeah, like it's important to have someone that's going to understand your local state jurisdiction law. If there's an issue, they can push back real hard. Mm-hmm. Like a conveyance rule snap, like oh you're going to go get yourself a lawyer now, right? <laughs> it's like a push comes to shove. And contracts, could contracts? I actually think contracts are all bullshit, right? Like you can manipulate it, you can take it, like you can drag something out to court. Like yeah. the amount of times that I've dragged things along, I've had to just out of survival, I've had to drag on. If they were using a, a conveyance, they're like, I would have just got everything I want because I'm just like, well, sue me, right? I'm, mm. I'm doing whatever I want. Mm. So um, having a lawyer is, is very, very crucial, I believe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just making sure that the contract terms and have been negotiated for, for what your needs are because everybody has different needs for, for their property transaction and um, and you know we can incorporate those terms into the contract. Yeah. So what's that here? Uh, Matt said, what what can we do for asset protection? Um, maybe if you can expand upon that, Matt. Um, there's all different ways of asset protection, put in trusts and, and different things like that naturally. Um, put the second mortgage on the property different things that, that can be done to to protect yourself but it depends on what aspect we're yeah. looking at yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah on that note folks um, I know we've been here for one and a quarter hours I uh, want to thank everyone for tuning in and, and having a part of it having us as a part of our reviewing um, if you have any questions flick them through over the next minute otherwise we will sort of wrap it up there um, if you want to get in contact with Stephen, how would someone contact you, Stephen? Yeah, probably best via email. So just uh, yeah. Yeah, Stephen at centerflegal.com.au. Cool. And, and phone number? And yeah, um, it's 02877891000. Cool. And you look after a lot of different states? Yes, yeah, yeah, so at the, yeah, so the moment we do New South Wales, um, Queensland, uh, WA, and Victoria. Yeah, cool. And you're moving to. And we're looking I'm to expand, yes. Yeah. Stephen goes, Stephen's mm-hmm. like so nervous here on uh, on camera online going, <laughs> oh, every state, right? Yeah. But um, we, we, we'll be, um, Stephen will be in every state shortly. Um, yeah. I'll keep pushing him to get to every state. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you have a question or need some help or guidance, just reach out. So, um, yeah, if you guys need help in, in building out a portfolio or you know, growing your portfolio, um, there's a link in the description. You can click on that. Uh, book yourself in for a discovery session with my team. Um, you know, whether you're growing that portfolio uh, or whatnot, and um, we're, we're here to help you on that journey. Uh, Justin says, uh, keep in touch if you're coming there. Uh, mate, send me a text. We'll chat later. Um, yeah. <laughs> on that note, folks, I will catch up shortly. Thanks all for watching. Keep kicking ass with your goals and make sure that you're doing everything you can to live life on your terms and uh, make cool stuff happen. So um, catch up soon, guys. Bye for now. Thanks, Thanks. Steve, for coming on. Thanks, Dave. Cheers. See you guys. See you.